sermon by the seashore today comes from Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We'll start reading with verse 30. Mark 6, starting with verse 31. The apostles gathered together with Jesus. And they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. The people, however, saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all of the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go and to the cities and surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and spend two hundred denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and look. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set them before the people. And he divided up the two fish among them too. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up twelve full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. There were five thousand men who ate the loaves. The five thousand is, feeding the five thousand is an amazing story. In fact, it's so amazing that it's the only miracle Jesus performed other than the resurrection. It's in all four Gospels. It must have had a tremendous impact on the people who were there that day. Certainly all four of the gospel writers thought it was important enough to put in their, their gospel. But in a way it's a little bit misleading because verse 44 says there were 5,000 men who ate. But when you look at some of the other accounts, you know, there's three other accounts in the same, same situation, we find out in Matthews in particular that there were 5,000 men besides women and children. And we know there was one boy there because he was his sack lunch Jesus used to feed these people with. So even though this is an, an amazing and miraculous story, there are still this, <laughs> some things about it that we just don't want to overlook. In fact, R.C. Foster, in studies in the life of Christ, he says, there could have been as many women and children present as there were men that day. And so, 5,000, let's 5,000, let's see. Yeah, 10,000 people. <laughs> now, if you were listening to the June Church moment, you know how incredible feeding that many people was with five loaves and just two fish. Now, last week we talked about the, the 153 fish and we assumed that they probably were big fish. <laughs> well, the boys fish he had in his lunch, they weren't that big. Uh, you could probably hold both of those fish in your hand, actually. But Jesus was able to take the little that he had, five loaves and two fish, and feed 10,000 people. And 
verse 43 says they picked up 12 full baskets when they were done. Now, you know, the Bible doesn't say this, but this is my way of thinking. The reason there was 12 baskets, full baskets, was because each one of the 12 disciples got one. And Jesus made sure there was 12 baskets, one for each of them, because he wanted them to get the point of what he was doing here. He was showing them and growing their faith that he could take a little and make it much. He took 12 average common guys and he turned the world upside down with them. He took a boy's sack lunch and he fed 10,000 people. What do you think he could do with you? Lame. Well, three things I want you to see here today. The first one is that sometimes we get too busy to eat. Have you ever done that? You got so busy you just forgot to eat lunch? <laughs> you know? No. I don't see too many of you look like you've gone hungry. But, you know, sometimes we can get, really get into something and we just forget to eat. The disciples were that way, and actually, Jesus is talking about what had happened before the feeding of 5,000 ha happens here. The people were coming and going all the time from all these local countryside cities and villages, and they were so busy taking care of these people and their needs and teaching things that they didn't have time to stop and to eat. The crowd of people that were there was a real opportunity for ministry. And they were taking advantage of this opportunity and so they didn't even take time to eat. Jesus' disciples, verse 31, didn't take the time to eat. You know, as a preacher, I long for the time where people be so interested in what I'm saying <laughs> that they, don't, they aren't thinking about what restaurant they're going to when we're done here. <laughs> Jesus was still teaching the disciples using the learn-as-you-go method here through practical experience. He had them help deliver the miracle. <coughs> you know, with five loaves and two fish, he gave, broke them apart into pieces and he gave it to the twelve of them and they were passing it around. If Jesus could take that small sack lunch and feed all these people, he certainly could have delivered it himself. But no, he didn't do that. He got these twelve guys involved in what he was doing here, feeding all these people. You know, if, if, G, if Jesus wanted to, he could, he could win the whole city of Goshen. He could do that. But you see, he's given us that job. He's given us that responsibility. It's up to us to take the gospel to people and to help him deliver the miracle of salvation. That's really what the Great Commission is all about. For you and I, Take the gospel to people who don't know. What had happened prior to the feeding of the 5,000 was that John the Baptist had been arrested and put in prison and he'd now been beheaded. And they had just gotten the news that John the Baptist had, was dead. And they had been, you know, scurrying around, doing so much they haven't taken time to eat. And Jesus knows that one of the things they need to do is they need to go somewhere and just reflect on John the Baptist. Just remember John the Baptist. So he suggests they go to, to some secluded spot. Maybe they knew where the secluded spot was, maybe not, I don't know. Maybe they're just going to find a secluded spot. But they, they get into the boat and they start going out on the Sea of Galilee, going for the secluded spot, wherever it might have been. 
Well, it was still daytime, and the people could see what was going on, and so, you know, the people didn't have a boat to get in, but they could travel by shore and go around the Sea of Galilee, and I, I think it's kind of humorous that it says that the people got there before the boat did. Maybe they were running, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but they got there, so that when Jesus gets to shore, gets out of the boat, the people are already there waiting for him. You know, with the context of, of the feeding of the 5,000 still in their minds, you know, this guy can feed us with that small bit of food, and there's 12 baskets full left over. What is he going to do next? <laughs> you know? And so they were rushing to get to where he was going so they could be a part of whatever he was going to do next. Whatever the next, the next miracle was, you know? When you're too busy to eat, you're just too busy. <laughs> you need to slow down. We, we need to slow down from time to time, recharge our batteries. That's why we get together on Sunday, you know. Recharge our batteries so we can make it through another week. So we're prepared to talk to people about Jesus that we come in contact with, and those things. You know, we, need, we all need times of refreshing, times of retreat, times, times of recharging. Jesus is our example here. He, he took time to go on top of the mountains and pray many times because he, he needed that alone time to recharge his own batteries. Vance Hodner says this, if you don't come apart and rest, you will come apart. <laughs> so we need those times where, you know, we take time to refurbish ourselves, you know, Sometimes we need, we need to eat just to regain our strength a little bit. Let me tell you this little story. Several men were in a boat on a dangerous river, and one of them fell in who didn't have to swim. He was drowning. One of the other men in the boat was a Navy SEAL. And they got the boat over to where the man was, and the Navy SEAL reached down and grabbed the man, by the arm and he started pulling him in the boat and lo and behold the guy had a prosthetic arm and all he got was the arm. The man went down, started drowning again. The Navy SEAL knew he'd, he'd come back up. When he did, he grabbed him by the head, hair on his head and he had him on a toupee. And the guy starts drowning again. Well this time the Navy SEAL says, I'm going to go for something bigger. So he grabbed his leg. And you guessed it. He had a prosthetic leg as well. <laughs> he went down for the third time, but he came back up. And this time, the Navy SEAL got him around the, the head and pulled him into the boat. And the, the Navy SEAL said to him, well, if you were just held together, I could have gotten you in the boat sooner. <laughs> Sometimes... We're kind of like that. We seem to be falling apart because we haven't taken the time to refresh ourselves, to recharge our batteries, to, to get right with God again. That's why coming around the Lord's table and things is so, so important. You know, it helps us get ready for another week. We need time to recharge our spiritual batteries because we won't do anybody any good if we aren't ready for what's coming. And so we have to be ready. Abraham Lincoln said, if I'm going to chop wood eight hours a day, I need to take two hours of that day and keep my axe sharp. We need to be ready for what's ahead. The second thing I want you to see is sometimes we can be too proud to see. The disciples saw the crowd as a problem rather than as an opportunity. They were just thinking, how, how are we going to feed all these people? We can't do it. Instead of looking at the opportunity to feed all these people. Jesus said he, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The disciples had this grand opportunity to show them the shepherd. At a former church where we ministered, they built a new building. 
and there were it was a small town. There were four other churches in town, and and we hadn't had the, our new building built very long, and and the four ministers got together of these four churches, ours being one of them, with the idea of, of starting a Christian school in the town. Well, our, our church was brand new. It was the logical place for the new, new Christian school. <laughs> well, uh, I proposed the idea to the elders, and they thought it, it would be a good idea. And they took it to the congregation for a vote. And lo and behold, the congregation turned it down. And we didn't find out until a little bit later that some of the people in the church were going around telling people to vote no because we just had a brand new building. We put a school, Christian school in here. Now all these kids come in here. They're going to tear up the building. And it's brand new. <laughs> what an opportunity we could have had. But the people just saw it as a problem rather than as an opportunity. Jesus met the need of the people by teaching them and feeding them. You know, I don't know, I don't know if this really works or not, but when we go to a men's meeting, they feed us first food, and then we get the word of God. Maybe we ought to try that, you know? If you want to share the gospel with somebody, take them out to eat. You feed them first, maybe they'll listen to you then. People were hungry, of course. Listen to the disciples' solution. The disciples' solution was to send them away so they could find some food themselves. Okay, now there wasn't a McDonald's and a Burger King and an Arby's and, you know, just down the street. This was out in the middle of nowhere and there wasn't any place to go to get food. And that was the disciples' solution. You know, sometimes our solutions for problems don't make any sense. This is the disciples here. Send them away and they can find their own food. Well, how are they going to do that? Philip suggested, hey, we could, we could pool all of our money, come up with some money, and we could go to town and buy the food. Well, his, his uh, calculations was that it would cost 200 denarii, which is the equivalent of a whole year's salary for somebody. So the disciples' solution just <laughs> didn't make any sense. They probably didn't have that much money if they pulled all their money anyway. I mentioned to the junior church kids, you know, could 12 guys actually go to town and bring back food for 10,000 people anyway? I don't think so. You know? They probably couldn't even found a market that had enough food to feed 10,000 people. I, I don't want really to know, but it seems logical to me that, you know, even if you did go to town and go to the local market, <laughs> would they have that much food? I don't know. <coughs> See, sometimes what we think this isn't going to work. We have to depend on a higher power <laughs> to do that. And Jesus had the answer. He says, well, what do you have? And he says, go and look. And Andrew happens to find this, this little boy who has a sack lunch with five loaves of bread and two fish in it. And that's all Jesus needed. You know, Jesus didn't need a lot. He just needed a little so he could increase it to a lot. That's the way with you and me, you know. <laughs> he just needs a little bit of our time. He just needs a little bit of us. And he can do great things if we're available. The disciples hadn't yet learned to see people through Jesus' eyes. Okay, you see, when they looked out over these people who Jesus says were like sheep without a shepherd, all they saw was problem after problem after problem. <clears throat> Jesus saw opportunity after opportunity after opportunity yeah. for these people. Whenever you're in a problem, whenever you have a problem, how do you look at that problem? 
you look at it as an opportunity <coughs> for Jesus to teach you something? Or do you wring your hands and wonder, oh no, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I think we learn, need to learn to see things through Jesus' eyes. How does he see our problem? What does he want us to learn from our problem? But don't ask what now, but ask why. How many things have been invented because of a problem? My dad's a good example of this. Some of you have seen our rubbies machine in our basement. Uh, some of you helped carry it down the basement when we moved here. But mom and dad frequent the chiropractor quite often. And the chiropractor had this machine that, uh, well, it looked kind of like a, a bed thing. But before they would get their treatment, they would they laid on this, and it was a had a roller in it, and it went up and down your back and got you ready for the treatment. Well, Dad asked the chiropractor one time if he couldn't open it up and look inside of it, and he did. And so, anyway, he found copy machine motors, and uh, he had a tool and die shop, so he. He made a, a, a piece that was like a spiral thing, and, and so he made these things that he invented called rubbies machines. We had one, so whenever we have a back problem or a back's hurting, we go down, we, we lay on that, and there's two switches. One switch makes, makes the roller go around, the other one makes it go back and forth, so, you know, if ever you have a back problem, one can now try it. So let's know. <laughs> he invented that. And he also invented super spawn bait. He was fishing up at Allegan, Michigan one time, and uh, he ran out of bait. Well, he didn't want to leave the stream and leave his spot because, you know, if you lose your spot, somebody else is going to take it. And <clears throat> he saw, saw these guys, you know, one of these guys caught, caught a, I think it was a salmon maybe, but he took the salmon and he squeezed out some of the salmon eggs into a little net, tied it down on his hook, and he was fishing with that. My dad said, no, I think I could really make those things. And so he, he uh, took a drill press stand and hooked up a heater thing to it with a reservoir that he put plastic into and melted it. And then he, through his tool and die knowledge, made a mold of a, a rubber sack of salmon eggs and he got a patent on that, actually. <laughs> and so he even had a, he had what he called, he had, I don't know, five or six people who were called his stream team. And he gave them all the bait they, they wanted, and they just had to make a report every time they went fishing to him of what they caught, where they went, and all that. And one time up in Grand Rapids, he actually was on with Babe Winkleman and had a workshop at the outdoor arama up there. He invented the straight. Uh, in our first minister, ministry as a minister up in Barrington, Michigan, uh, I was the first full-time minister the church had ever had, so the money wasn't that great. So I made the bait in my basement, in the church basement, the Michigan basement, sandy floor. But I made the stuff, and then on my day off, when the spring and fall salmon runs were, I would go down one side of the state of Michigan, on Lake Michigan, one day a week, as far as I could go, from the time the bait shops open until they closed. And then the next week on the day off, I'd go down on Lake Huron side. All because my dad patented and made this bait. And something didn't land come that way. You see, there were problems that he saw as opportunities. And so he made this machine called the Rubbies, and he made this bait called Super Spawn solve problems. When we have a problem, that's what we need to see too. We need to find a way to solve our problem. Helen Keller learned to sign sign language even though she was deaf and blind. Because Ann Sullivan saw the potential in Helen Keller rather than the problem of her blindness and deafness. What do you see when there are problems? We need to turn our stumbling blocks into stepping stones for success. 
Third thing I want you to see is that we can become too tight to give. Too tight to give. You know, oftentimes we measure our resources and decide if we can give or whether we can do something based upon what we're going to get out of it. Instead, we need to look at God's will and trust Him to meet needs, to meet our needs. Andrew found the boy with a sack lunch. And Jesus took that, even though it was little, and fed 10,000 people. And there were 10, 12 basketfuls left over of the pieces. Do you think the disciples learned anything that day? By being a part of the miracle, passing them out, and then collecting the leftovers, and having their basket run over, because they were so full. I think they did. I think God wanted them to learn as they were going that God could take little and wouldn't it make much. People want the gift. But they don't want the giver. They want all the privileges, and not the responsibilities. This miracle happened right in Jesus' hands as he looked up to heaven and blessed the loaves and the fish and passed them out. If you would have been there, how would you have described it? How would you have described the, the fact that the five loaves and two fish began to multiply and fed all those people? How could you describe it? <laughs> Other than the fact that Jesus must be God's son. <laughs> Jesus must have control over physical things. You know, there are four things that you can do with your hands. You can wring them in despair. You can fold them in idleness. You can clench them into fists in anger. Or you can open them in helping someone else. That's from bits and pieces. January 5th, 1995. I wonder what Jesus could do with you if you put yourself into his hands. I wonder who you would go and tell the good news to. I wonder what you would do with some of the extra food you have or some of the extra clothes you have. Would you give them to the Ukrainian refugees? How about some of the extra time that you have? Would you see problems as opportunities? And then go and try to do something about them? Or would you just say, well, someone else will take care of that. I don't have the time. What could you do to help people if you saw them through Jesus' eyes? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for allowing us, though we're little, to have the hope that you can do much with us. Though we have imperfections, though we have few abilities sometimes, Though our talents seem to be little, you can take the little that we have and do much. Father, I pray that there's not one person here today that doesn't see that you can do a lot with them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be singing the invitation today. If you don't need Jesus Christ because you've already got him, and use this invitation time as a time to search yourself for what you can do for God.